You are listening to By the Book, because if you don't look at the world through the Bible, you will never see it right. Welcome to By the Book. This is Alan Griffith, your host for episode 156. I'm glad you're with us today. I want to ask you a question. Are you ready to vote? Maybe you already voted. If so, did you vote right? If you haven't voted yet, are you going to vote? How are we voting? Are you voting for a woman to be able to kill her unborn child anytime from conception to uh, birth? Is that what you're voting for? Is that what you're in favor of? Well, I sure hope not. If you're a Christian, I hope you vote right. If you're not a Christian today, I hope you vote right anyway. What a terrible time we live in. Are we voting in favor of uh, transgenderism and uh, all of the filth that comes along with the perversion of the sexes and genders? Is that what we're voting for? I hope not. I hope we vote. I hope we make a statement. Uh, We'll know soon, won't we? We'll know soon. Maybe you've already voted. Well, uh, next week is our men's conference, November 8th and 9th. And men, we'd love to have you come. If you haven't gotten on the Biblical Family Ministries website and gotten the information, I hope you will, and I hope you'll come. Uh, We have reservations made, rooms reserved at a Comfort Inn nearby. You'll get a good price. Or if you're just going to drive in and back home again for the conference, that's fine. But we'd love to have you come. The theme this year is a call to faithfulness, and that call needs to be issued. I'll tell you, we need to be faithful. And that's a call for everybody. Of course, our focus is on men, but everybody should be faithful. And uh, But we want to encourage the men, because if you get men to be faithful, they'll have impact on their wives, they'll have impact on their children, they'll have impact on their church. I marvel at how many men are not leading. I know of men, but they, they change churches because their wife wanted to go somewhere else, or they change churches because their children wanted to go somewhere else because there was a better youth program or whatever it might be. Let me tell you something, sir. You are the leader. You are responsible. You need to make the decisions. You need to care for your wife and children and see that their needs are met. And if your church is not everything it ought to be, then maybe you can make it better. Now, if it's a doctrinal problem, if you can't affect that change and get things right, then get out of there. But if it's simply a a program problem, then get involved and, and make it right. But you be the leader. You be the leader, sir. You be the leader. And uh, God will bless you for it, and he'll bless your family for it as well. Well, we are talking about the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, We talked about it last episode. I want to return to that topic in this episode. And I'm sure we've talked about some of these things before, but that's not the issue. The issue is that you and I get into the Word of God and get stirred, and if we are not stirred about the hope of the return of Christ right now, then something's wrong with us. And so we're getting into the Word of God to restir and to get us excited about it. Again, if you're not excited about the possibility of Christ returning in light of what's going on in this country and this world, then I don't know what's wrong. But uh, we need to be stirred. And so well, that's why we're into these texts. We've looked at a couple of texts from 1 Corinthians and Philippians. And uh, 1 Thessalonians, we're going to get back to 1 Thessalonians at some point. But we looked at those encouragements to be looking and waiting for the Lord Jesus Christ because he is coming again. Right now, Jesus Christ is in heaven, the third heaven, the, the very abode of God, where the, the Father, as it were, has taken up residence. There is a throne there. There are people there. People that I know and love are there. And the Lord Jesus is there, described in Scripture as seating, being seated at the right hand of the Father. Now, the time is going to come when he is going to leave that heavenly abode. 
He is going to come back to this realm, and he is going to appear in the air. He's not going to come to the earth this first time, this time that we call the rapture. He is going to appear in the air, and he is going to gather unto himself the church. It's an amazing thing to anticipate and think about. I love to think about it. I love to talk about it. I love to read the scripture about it and to get into my mind. Yeah, this is really going to happen. You and I have never seen anything like this, but it's going to happen in a moment of time. Jesus Christ is going to come back and he's going to take us away. He's going to snatch us away. And again, we're going to talk more about the specifics of that, perhaps in our next episode. But in this particular episode, I want to go to Titus. We're going to spend a few moments in chapter 1, and then we're going to move over to chapter 2, and the very familiar passage that talks about us needing to be pure and faithful as we look for and wait for the Lord Jesus Christ. In Titus chapter 1 and verse 16, Paul is writing to Titus. He had left Titus in Crete to minister to people, to get pastors for the little churches that had started, etc. And then he is warning Titus about the phonies. I'll put it that way. They, They claim to be Christians, but they're not living for God. And here's what he says about them in verse 16. And I, I am starting here because this is what moves him to the challenge that we're going to look at in the second chapter. But what he says about these people is something we could say about many today. So here's what he said in verse 16 of Titus 1. He said, they profess that they know God. Well, there's a lot of people who profess that they know God. There's a lot of people who say they're okay with God. There's a lot of people who say they are saved. And you and I can't read hearts. But here's what Paul says. They profess, that's with their lips, their words, they profess that they know God. But in works, their life the way they act, the things they do, the places they go, whatever it might be. He said, but in works, they deny him. Now get that picture. Here's somebody saying, I'm saved. I know God. I'm going to heaven. And then they live a life that says, I don't know God. I'm not living for God. I'm not serving God. Something radically wrong with that but that is too common today, and it's becoming more common. He said in works they deny him, being abominable. What's that mean? It means they're doing things and living in such a way that is disgusting to God. It ought to be disgusting to us, but that's his point. What a message. What a challenge. And then he says they are disobedient. They don't obey the Bible. They don't obey what the Bible says. Maybe they don't know what the Bible says. They haven't taken time to find out what the Bible says, but they are disobedient to the Bible. So here's somebody who says, I know God, I'm saved, but then they don't obey the Bible. How many times I've heard people say something like this, I know what the Bible says, but, and then they want to tell me why they think it's okay for them to disobey the Bible. Well, it's not okay. Now, you need to keep the Bible in its proper, I'll say, a historical and dispensational context. There are some things said in the Bible that aren't said to the church. They're said to the nation of Israel or whatever it might be. We need to understand those things. But when we identify, this is what the Bible says to me. This is what the Bible says to the believer of this age. We need to be obedient to it, not disobedient. And then he says in this same verse, unto every good work reprobate. In other words, they are rejecting 
the good. They are rejecting what is right. They are doing what is wrong. And in the midst of that kind of a life, they dare to profess with their lips, their words, that they actually know God. That cannot be you. And that cannot be me. And Paul was going to give an exhortation to Titus about that. Now, he moves on in chapter 2, and he talks about older men, older women, young women, young men, and saying, here's how they ought to live. And so he's showing how their false professions, at least the false professions of many, should be counteracted by living according to to what the Bible says. In fact, Paul says in chapter 2 and verse 1, speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. And I'd like to emphasize this, like it or not, there is a way of life that matches sound biblical doctrine. And that was Paul's concern. There are people who say, oh, I believe, and then they deny Christianity by the way they live. So what she's doing in in, uh, chapter 2 is saying, let me tell you how you're supposed to live if you are a Christian. And he has a, a whole lot of things to say there that we're not going to get into in this particular episode. But we get down to verse 11 of chapter 2, and I want to spend some time looking at that verse and the verses to follow. Because the challenge of this episode is that with Jesus Christ coming again, we are looking, we are longing, we are waiting, but the challenge is this, that we be faithful as we wait. Be faithful as we wait. We don't know when he's coming. And some people, as I alluded to in our last episode, have this idea, oh, they've been talking about him coming for a long time and he hasn't come yet. Listen, you and I have to live with the expectation that he is coming and the hope that he might, in fact, come today. And when you do, that'll keep you on track. At least that's what it's supposed to do. So here we are in Titus chapter 2. We're talking about the return of Christ, the fact that he's coming again. And verse 11 says, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. I'm going to make a statement on that, a very simple statement. Anybody could get saved because Jesus Christ died for all. I'm just going to make that statement. I'm not going to get into the discussions of Calvinism and and some of these foolish ideas. The grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. Jesus Christ died for everybody. I asked a young man in an ordination council just a couple of weeks ago, would you be comfortable? Here was my question to him. Would you be comfortable if you had the ability to speak to the entire world at the same time Would you be comfortable in saying this? Jesus Christ died for you. And he was quick to say, yes, he would not only be comfortable doing it, he would love to do it. Well, I want to tell you something. I wish we had that opportunity. I wish we had that means that we could speak to the entire world in a moment of time and say to the entire world at the same time, Jesus Christ died for you. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. But tragically, as you may know, there are preachers and teachers who would say this. No, I could not say to the world, Jesus Christ died for you. That is a tragedy. So the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. It's for everybody. The grace of God, however, does not only bring a message of salvation to us. The grace of God, once we are saved, continues to minister to us. In other words, God, by his grace, continues to minister to us, to teach us, and to mature us. 
And so in verse 12 of Titus 2, here's what he says, teaching, teaching, the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us. Are you saved today? If you're saved, this is for you. If you're not saved, you need to get saved. He says, the grace of God teaches us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Now, this is an amazing verse because there's a a approach to Christianity today called grace living. And grace living, as it is taught by many today, is just the opposite of what is said here in verse 12. Because grace living is the attitude of, well, I'm saved, I can pretty well live any way I want to live because of the grace of God. Their attitude is, I'm not under the law, and praise the Lord, we aren't. But to them, that means they have no standards or values that would guide them or are appropriate for all Christians. Each man does his own thing. That's a shame. Well, here's what verse 12 says. And this is leading to you and me looking for the return of Christ. So he says in verse 12, teaching us that denying ungodliness. Denying is is to refuse and to reject, to deny ungodliness. What is ungodliness? Ungodliness is when we do not give God his rightful place in our lives. We are godly when we are fully surrendered to the Lord. And we need to reject ungodliness. We need to reject anything and everything that will move us away from complete service and surrender to the Lord. Anything that's going to turn us away from him, we have to reject that. And that can be a lot of things. I mean, that can be people. That can be circumstances. That can be where we go. That can be the... TV that we watch. I don't know what it might be, but there's a lot of ungodliness that is coming at us all the time, trying to move us away from God. And you and I need to look at those things and say, I want nothing to do with that. I'm not going to go that direction. We also, the verse says, have to deny worldly lust. Lust is desire. There's a lot of desires, wrong kinds of desires that are stirred in us by the world we live in. And again, it might be what we see, what we hear, uh, where we go. There's a lot of wrong desires that are stirred up in us, and we have to, again, deny them. We have to reject them. Realize this, that every time we sin, it's because we choose to. Uh, we are told in Scripture by, by James that we are tempted, tempted to sin when we are drawn away of our own lust. Now, you and I can be tempted, as it were, in, in a moment, or at least have circumstances where we could fall in a moment. All of a sudden, there is something. I shouldn't be looking. I shouldn't see it. shouldn't hear it, whatever it might be, but there it is. And the issue now is, what do I do with that? Do I respond to that? Do I let that take hold of me? Do I focus on that? Or do I immediately turn away from it? Well, when you and I yield to that and go in that direction, that's when we are tempted. Now, believe it or not, it isn't that issue that is tempting us. It is our response to that that is when the temptation will lead us towards sin. So I have to deny, I have to reject those kinds of desires. Rather, Paul goes on and says, we should live soberly, seriously, uh, disciplined, uh, guarded in our life, and we should live righteously. We should live with the commitment to do 
what is right. Now, you find out what is right through the scriptures. And when you and I find out what is right according to the Bible, that's what we have to do. We have to live righteously. And then counteracting the ungodliness earlier in the verse, he says, and we should live godly. Giving God first place. Do you do that? Can you honestly say you do that? I give God first place in my life. I live surrendered to him. I live serving him. I live honoring him. Now, these challenges are given to us as Christians. It's the grace of God, once we get saved, where God continues to teach us, and he teaches us, get away from the wrong. Commit yourself to what is right. And then he puts it this way, in this present, the term world in our King James Version, representing the term that is often rendered age. This present age, I want to tell you, we are living in a wicked world. We are living in a wicked age. Things are getting worse and worse and worse. The perversion is unbelievable that we have to hear about and sometimes see every single day. But I am here knowing that Jesus Christ is coming back. He could come back at any moment. And while I am waiting and looking for him, I'm supposed to live with godly standards. We have to be faithful to the Lord while we wait. And so with that challenge of verse 12, let me read it to you again teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, verse 13, looking, looking. Are we looking? Looking for what? Looking for Christ. Do you live looking for Christ? Do you get up in the morning and wonder, is this the day? Is this the day? As you go through the day, do you, do you wonder, might this be the day? Could this be the time when Jesus Christ returns? We're supposed to live as godly people, faithful people, looking, looking for what? looking for that blessed hope. That's Christ. There is no hope in this world. This world is not going to change. This world is not going to get better. This world is not going to get godly and spiritual. This world is not going to turn to the Lord. This world is marching away from God as quick as it can. Our hope is not here. Our hope is in Christ. And we are looking for that blessed hope. Even so, come Lord Jesus. We are looking for what is further described as the glorious appearing. I can't even imagine what it's going to be like. Sometimes when my wife and I dry, we look up into the sky and the clouds are a certain fashion or the sun's rays are coming through them or there's a silver lining on the cloud, whatever it might be. And it's like, boy, wouldn't this be a, a time for the Lord Jesus to come? What a glorious appearing that's going to be. You can't wait. You can't wait. I want to see him. We've never seen him. And there's people I love in heaven, and I want to be reunited with them. And the world is on its way to judgment. 
So we are looking for the glorious appearing of the Lord Jesus, who is described in this verse, Titus 2.13, as the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, that's not two distinct people, the great God and our Savior. That There's a Greek construction. You would read it this way, the great God, even our Savior, Jesus Christ, because Jesus Christ is, in fact, God. He's the second person of the Godhead. That's how we describe him. God is a triune being, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Our Lord Jesus Christ is as much God as the Father is God. He is as much God as the Holy Spirit is God. And we are looking for and longing for the glorious appearing of the great God, even our Savior, Jesus Christ. He's coming again. He's coming back. You and I have to believe that. You and I have to live looking for his return. And living looking for his return will hopefully cause us to live faithfully and godly. Verse 14 goes on and says this, who, the Lord Jesus Christ, gave himself for us. Nobody took his life from him. He gave himself for us. Why? That he might redeem us. The term redeem can speak of purchase, or it can speak of setting free. He gave himself for us that he might redeem us. He might buy us with the shedding of his blood and set us free. It says, redeem us from all iniquity. We're sinners, aren't we? I hate sin. I hate sin in my own life. I hate what sin does to people around us. I hate what sin is doing to this world. And iniquity often refers to the not just the action of sin, but the heart problem. But he gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity. Wouldn't you like to be thoroughly cleansed and pure on the inside as well as the outside? And it says that he might purify unto himself. That means to, to single us out to belong to him. Purify unto himself a peculiar people. And, of course, we always tease about that. We all know peculiar people. But the term peculiar means this, a people of his own. I belong to him. You belong to him if you're saved. Now, we don't belong to other people. We don't belong to ourselves. We belong to him. And he wants to purify unto himself. He wants us to be singled out as his children so that we would in this life be zealous of good works. That we would live in such a way as we'd look at the wicked and say, I don't want to do that. I don't want to go there. I don't want to see that. I don't want to live in that mess. I don't want to do those things. I want to be zealous in my service for Christ. I want to live for him. I want to love him. I want to tell other people about him. That's the life that I want to live. That's the life that I want to be dedicated to. And I want to be living that way on that day and in that moment when my Lord Jesus Christ comes back. And I don't know when he's coming. I hope it is yet today. And then Paul said to Titus, Titus was a young preacher. Here's what Paul went on to say as he closed this, this chapter, as we have it written as a chapter. He said, These things that I just told you, he said, these things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise thee. Paul knew that Titus might be held in contempt by people for preaching and teaching the way Paul was instructing him. And he said, don't you let people bother you. Don't you let people stop you 
from preaching the truth. And you know what? We can't do that today either. We need to stand for the truth, love the truth, tell the truth, preach the truth. Here's why Jesus Christ is coming again, and he might come today. Lord bless you till next time.